I've been waiting a minute. I've been waiting a minute. There he is. Jason Stark (laughs) from The Athletic, the Starkville pod, MLB Net, many other spots you've probably listened, watched, read articles in the past joining us right now. Jason, look at this crew you got. How you doing? Good one. What's happening in foul territory? (laughs) <laughs> what's up, what's up? we're good we're nearby too i know we're uh how, how by the way how close by are you to atlantic city <laughs> well i'm in phoenix arizona right now so not that close <laughs> but i mean no, you're no, in a, no, in, like in, in my normal world i'd be about yes. an hour and a half hour and 40 minutes depending on whether there are other cars trying to do that <laughs> right don't go friday in the summertime okay so tell me how arizona is let's start there and also we've seen some conventional and some unconventional so what you've noticed from the nlcs that has stood out and maybe become historic <laughs> well we had quite a game yesterday um the brandon fought decision i knew it was coming uh it wasn't a shock i totally understand it but am i allowed to say that I totally understand it, but I don't love it. Uh, what do you guys think? Agree. Agree. And I, I, yeah. Leave the guy in. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I, I did some research on this, as I'm prone to do, right? And I, in the history of pro se- postseason baseball, I could only find one other time when a guy faced 18 hitters, struck out nine of them, gave up no runs, and then was taken out of a postseason game. And you guys know what it was. It was the Blake <laughs> Snell game, and that's yep. it. And uh, Blake Snell obviously had a little different pedigree than Brandon fought. But, you know, I, I've been watching the Phillies play baseball, destroy baseballs, uh, just bludgeon teams, especially this month. And those are the worst at-bats, one after another after another that I've seen them have the whole postseason just didn't get a good read on anything coming out of Brandon Ford's hand. And, you know, the eye test I understand is not in fashion right now, but if you're using the eye test, there's no way you take that guy out of the game. Uh, Are we allowed to use it though? Yeah. So my question to you is, are people starting to understand who this guy really is? This guy's an absolute stud. He's coming off of really good performances his last five, like Eric said earlier. This kid is an absolute stud, and he totes the rubber and said, listen, just give me the ball. <laughs> he, he certainly wanted the ball. And, you know, people I've seen people use the, the metrics, the data, and the third time through the order and all of that. That stuff isn't very relevant, I don't think, just because – He's a different pitcher now than he was most of the time he was out there this season. He's been so good since he came back from the minors that second time, right? And, you know, the fastball, four seam and two seam have such great spin and life. Um, the, the, the sweeper comes out of the same slot. And just look at the swings, Look at those swings that the Phillies hitters took after over the first two games, their slash line was essentially Barry Bonds 2000. They were a whole team (laughs) full of Barry Bonds for two games. And then they had no ability to, to, to read the stuff coming out of Brandon Fott's hands. And it was impressive. So sans steroids, you're saying you're not you're not accusing the Phillies of anything, are you? Because this is <laughs> you, you won't be allowed is in the that stadium. What I did? <laughs> that, that is not what I did there, Eric. Rex. <laughs> Good try. Is there, is there ever going to be a GM slash team constructor who's going to bring in a manager who's going to say, "Hey, you know what? All this for third time through the order stuff is going to work for us in the long haul of a season." But in the playoffs, I'm a GM that, that you know, figures stuff out in the playoffs. Is there ever going to be a GM like that, or they don't have the cojones? <laughs> well, uh, you know, Dusty Baker and Bruce Bochy are managing in the ALCS, right? And Rob Thompson, uh, is a, he's, a, he's a big fan of using your eyes for the most part. But October baseball is different, and I think that is a big part of what we saw yesterday. Um, you know, it's a really fascinating time in our sport. And 
I, you know, the way teams think now to me is one of the most fun parts of modern baseball, but not, that doesn't mean we have to like everything. And here, like, here's where I come off on this. The things that make great baseball strategy are not necessarily the things that make great entertainment strategy. And the game's just more entertaining when you let that starting pitcher go through the lineup a third time, maybe even a fourth time. But, I, you know, I, I think what I saw yesterday was Tori Lavula saying, I have a guy here who hasn't quite earned that because he did that with Zach Gallon and Merrill Kelly. And, you know, I, I asked Tori almost this exact question after the game. You know, I told him, like, I understand what you did, but you spent a lifetime in the game. And you know what starting pitchers used to do, used to be, used to represent in October. So was there any part of you who thought – all right, what we did worked for us, but it's not the best thing for the game. And he kind of conceded that point. Uh, and I think he understands our point of view, Eric, but he's got to do what he's got to do to win a game down 2-0. So I'm going to go right back to where I started. I understand it. I just don't <laughs> have to like it. I think you would agree with us up here on the board here that baseball is better, more talented, faster, stronger than it's ever been. Yes? I do agree. So are we getting in the way of truly exposing that, truly showing that off by these types of moves? Boy, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I do think in a way, yes, because, you know, the moments that we tend to remember from postseason baseball are not the stuff that happens the first two times through the order. <laughs> you know, it's, it says those games are a, approaching that dramatic finale. We haven't had a lot of dramatic finales. We did have one in this game. And, it, you know, I'm, it, there's nothing cooler than that, like the, the image of Jack Morris looking at Tom Kelly and saying, Get off my mound. <laughs> you're, you're not taking me out of this game. And I, I, I you know, the last. What the, the last starting pitcher allowed to finish a close out game was Josh Beckett, right? That was 20 years ago. And I remember actually being in a clubhouse talking to Josh Beckett, and the Jack Morris game was on, okay? And he said to me, Watch this. This is my favorite part of this game. Tom Kelly's about to go to the go to the mound and he's gonna chase him off his mound. <laughs> and um, so I don't I don't know if that's necessarily we're necessarily talking about athleticism. But we are talking about greatness, and those are moments when great pitchers get to rise up and show us their special level of greatness. And I just miss that. So, Jason, can I make the case that I was way more pissed off about the Jose Barrios situation versus fought? And sure, oh, there's sure. going to be some people that are now just playing it up. It, it, it's, people start to take sides like, oh, we're going to every time someone's removed, we're going to make a thing out of it. I'm like, OK. This is a rookie. Velo came down a little bit. Obviously, he was pitching well, and he was on a low pitch count. But for me, Jose Barrios has been around for a while. I know he's had his ups and downs and inconsistency, and, and there's problems when he's facing the order, you know, a second or third time through. It just felt like everybody was looking at the same thing, and there was not enough of a leash. Plus, that was after three innings? Not even. Three. It was into the third. Into the third. Into the third. And, and what was fought? Fought was at... Five and two. Five and two thirds. It, 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 to me, it's such a different case, and I feel like this yesterday was a win for those that are like, "You got to follow the script." See, that worked out perfectly for Arizona, and I'm like, "Cool." But the overall topic, like what we're going over here, is that you have a hundred million dollar pitcher in Jose Barrios who's got good stuff, and he is super streaky. But he was one of, on one of those good streaks. So, screw the script for a few minutes, okay? Let's ride this. <laughs> And if that changes, okay. And I get it. The team didn't score runs. But I think the Barrios one is what really bothered most people. Were, were you yeah. like, ah, oh, guys, come on, when that happened? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, one time through the order for a pitcher like that versus two times through the order for Brandon Fought. Of course, those are two different things. But, you know, you mentioned the magic word, and the magic word is script. Scott, you ever had a conversation with Buck Showalter and used that word script? game script okay actually i have i've done i've done some games with him jason and right. um 
and it's a great way to get him fired up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take much. Just put in a quarter and, the, you know, he does the rest. Um, I, I, I've had this conversation with him so many times, and the question he always asks is, what if the game doesn't follow the script? Uh, the, was the Jose Barrios game following the script? We all, don't we know the answer to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So was the, and that's, was but that's what happens most of the time. How often, I mean, how often does a game <laughs> actually follow the script? Almost never. Like, and I, I get it. Like, they're going over a million different scenarios, right? You guys can maybe speak to this better. Where, where, did you observe scripts? When you were playing? Yes. Yeah, you did? For sure. Yes. So, so tell us exactly how it went down. Would they be like, this is the exact pitching plan, and if this happens, this is what we do. If this happens, this is what we do, right? 2014 Royals. We're in San Francisco. Ned Yost looks down, and he goes, oh, yeah, we got to put in Kelvin Herrera. It's the sixth inning. Ned Yost never looked at the fact that Kelvin Herrera's spot was going to come up in a National League game to hit. He got the three outs. He looked down, and he goes, oh, crap. I saw the bench coach. <laughs> now Pedro Gafal go, oh, he's got a hit, who technically wasn't the bench coach. They were look, talking over Wakamatsu, who was the bench coach. They didn't listen to him. Anyway, that's another story. But <laughs> they looked down, and they were like, oh, crap, he's got a hit. So who did we send up there in San Francisco? Oh, Kelvin Herrera like this. <laughs> Fortunately, he went back out for a second inning like he had done every other time during the entire season. He was the sixth and seventh inning guy. Got his outs. We ended up winning the game, so it wasn't a big story. But I sat on the bench looking at it, it and going, have been. holy crap, he screwed this up. <laughs> I was talking to Johnny G. Vitella was standing right next Johnny to me. G. And I said, <laughs> I said, G, because he hadn't been in the National League yet. I said, hey, this is where we double switch. We had just made our last out with Moustakis. They could have put uh, Jason Nix in the game. Nixie could have come in, played defense for him. It would have been a double switch. Kelvin's fine. He doesn't have to hit. They didn't. And it kind of got washed under the rug because we won the game. Wow. There you go. And that's how a script works. <laughs> well, all right. See, I, I don't, you know, the, the whole sixth inning, seventh inning, eighth inning guy script, that's totally shredded now. Right? Nobody uses that script <laughs> for good reason. I, you know, I understand the idea of matching up different pitchers with different pockets of the lineup. Of course you do. Yeah. Um, and it just, it's just a matter of picking the spot. Right? The, uh, baseball... Look, my whole career is baseball doesn't follow scripts. Okay, <laughs> That's what I write about more than any other topic. So um, let's keep that in mind. Yes. I want to go to the Phillies for a little bit. I've asked this question before, but you think about, like, what helps a team out, you know, hitting, pitching, defense, that kind of stuff. I want to talk about the crowd there. And it, it, do you – You've been around many ballparks in your career. You've been around the craziness, the loudness. Is this Philly's factor of being at home like or the real deal? Because from watching on TV, it looks like it's absolute insanity. It, it's insanity. It, it really is. I, I, you know, I've, I, I haven't lived in Philadelphia my whole life, but most of my life. And there's really never been anything quite like this where nobody ever sits down. For three hours, uh, you know, my daughter was at the game the other night, and after the seventh inning stretch, she texted me and she said, "We got to change the name of this thing to the seventh inning rest." Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody stands for three hours, and you know, it's not just about the noise, Todd. Because you know, when people say, "Oh, it's louder than it was when they won in 2008," well, I, I forget to carry around my personal decibel meter, <laughs> so I'm pretty sure it was loud then. But here is the difference. As, you know, if you go back to 2008 and those years, everybody sitting in those seats was scarred by 50 years of losing, you know, of all the times they almost won but didn't. And that generation no longer fills the seats. The people who sit there now or stand there now, um, they're people who've seen the Phillies win the World Series. They've seen the Eagles win the Super Bowl. They've seen both of them get to another World Series and a Super Bowl. Life is good now. They're not as scarred. And, you know, the whole, the whole thing with Trey Turner, I think, was an example of how people are starting to understand you can use the passion that Philadelphia is always so famed, famous for um, – for good, okay? You don't have to necessarily use it to 
boo and to spew and to, to let people know how nervous you are about everything. And I think that's really what we are seeing. Is the last thing, the last thing that Bryce Harper needs on his legacy is the World Series? And is it a tainted legacy if he doesn't win a World Series championship? Well, wouldn't, wouldn't you look at how he's done in October and said it wasn't exactly his fault? <laughs> you know, he's, I, he, ranks, yeah. he ranks number three all time now in postseason slugging and postseason OPS, and the only guys ahead of him are Ruth and Gehrig. So they felt just a little different to me. You know, this isn't the NBA where you have to win to validate. Uh, it's a little different than playing quarterback in the NFL where you have to win to validate it. Baseball, you can only do so much. And so, look, he's he's obviously obsessed with this and energized by this. But, you know, I tend to look at the full body of work when I try to take stock of this stuff. And I, I'd have a hard time saying if the Phillies didn't win the World Series again this year, you could blame it on him. <laughs> let me let me ask you this question here because a lot of people are saying you know the top teams aren't in it um it's kind of been you know a little bit of a boring playoffs what, what would you say to that because i feel like it, these teams that are in it actually it, it's pretty good for baseball so on the contrary to that what, what's your beliefs and how do you think this playoffs have been going well uh I, these are two separate topics uh the, the first topic is i always look at this as it's not my problem, <laughs> okay, <laughs> who gets there. Um, I, I enjoy it when some team like the Diamondbacks shows up on this stage because it's really a chance to see what Tel Marte is all about, you know, and what Corbin Carroll is all about. And these are life-changing, career-changing, career-defining moments for guys like that. And, you know, we spend so much of our time talking about six teams, eight teams, 10 teams. And when some other team shows up, I think that's actually good for this sport. But the, the other side of it is how have I enjoyed the playoffs so far? We haven't had enough great games. You know, the, the fact that yesterday was the first walk-off of the entire postseason. Um, the fact that before that game in Arizona, we hadn't had a lead change in a week. At any point in any game, we hadn't had a lead change after the fourth inning in a week and a half. Um, you know, the, the sport's the, the greatest when you have these magical games. We, we, we're still looking for our first magical game. What's your favorite stat? I'm putting you on the spot here. What's your favorite <laughs> stat from this postseason? Because you always have the greatest, like, one-line blips of stats. And so I'm putting you on the spot. What is your favorite from this postseason that kind of encapsulates what this postseason has been so far? Okay. I got to give this some thought <laughs> because I, there's, a, there's a lot of stats that I tend to spew out there. Um, it's a lot of pressure, Kratz. It's a lot of pressure. Oh, it's listen, like saying that's a lot of pressure, pressure with that. Pressure, baby. You it's can like, use um, recency bias and just be like, oh, here's yeah. one the other day that I really liked, right? <laughs> How about Evan he, Carter, man? He's a beast. He, he, well, I mean, I I haven't been covering that series, but let me, again, I got to think about this. The the Michael Carter catch, well, that that was an incredible moment because um, it, when, that, when that one happened, you know, I started huddling with my friends from Stats and saying, how are we going to demonstrate that no game has ever ended this way? And so we, we started going through every postseason game in history. And the fact that no outfielder had ever started a game-ending double play um, in the history of postseason baseball, and then that play happened, uh, that still kind of gives me goosebumps that play. And I, I wasn't actually there that night. I was watching my house. I live in Philadelphia. My family's all Phillies fans and they're all cursing and screaming. <laughs> and I'm all saying, what a freaking play. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I got it. I got in trouble with my family just for appreciating that moment. But when, when something happens in one of these games that we've never seen before, right. Um, th that, that's what gets my heart thumping. And, 
And then the, there's that whole Austin Wiley part of it too. Where did he come from? How did we ever have an eight five three double play? Uh, it's just amazing, amazing. Yeah, eight five three double plays don't happen all the time. It no. can't happen. <laughs> no. And the Michael Harris emotion too afterward was incredible. Obviously, I don't know if we want to go into what happened all the way after that when we got yeah, into the whole the whole attaboy, into the, the clubhouse whole... and all of that, which was fun. We loved it, by the way, as you can imagine. Yeah, we we, we love the we love the back and forth, of course. Uh, and there should be a lot more of that. Is there anything that you would change, or are you one of the um, complainers about the postseason format? And it doesn't even have to be the long layoff part. Just like anything at all, right? If you could change right now, because you're a big part of always writing about, you know, rule changes. And obviously the pitch clock's been awesome. You've been writing about that for years. Anything right now with the playoff format that you definitely like or don't like for the future? I, I am so tired of blaming the format. I'm so tired of it. <laughs> um, aren't the Astros the answer to every one of those complaints? Where last year, right, they had they had the, the five-day layoff, came back, and didn't lose a game to the World Series. They had a five-day lay, five layoff, swept. Had a four-day layoff swept again okay and won the world series uh, this year five day layoff what happened on the first pitch jose altuve went deep on the first pitch so i'm tired of blaming the format i'm tired of blaming the layoff uh the one thing i would kind of like to see is reseeding um i th i think reseeding is the fairest thing for the great team uh so i would do that um, and I don't buy the idea that logistically it's not possible. You know, I make a lot of reservations for travel for the postseason, not knowing where I'm going. I know you can do this. Uh, I know that this year, all right, I'm covering the National League. And if this should go seven, it means we won't know where the World Series will begin until about, 12 hours before we have to fly there for media day. Okay. So uh, <laughs> everything is possible. If you let it be possible, don't tell me it's not logistically possible. Hey, are you a, a big believer in um, human element umpire wise? Do you like that? The KBO is coming out and they're, you know, going to have that strike zone where you can, you know, Hey, it wasn't a strike. Can you look at it on the monitors? I mean, I like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't believe in getting rid of the umpires. What do you think about that one? Yeah, I, I don't want to get rid of them either. And I, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking into automatic ball strike systems and talking to players, managers, uh, umpires union about it. And all right, we've had a year now of people living with it in AAA. And the thing that's amazing is we now, I think, are at the point where technologically we could pretty much get every call right. And the people who live with it for a year, they don't want to live in that world. <laughs> like Planet Robot Up is not where they want to live. Uh, it, some sort of challenge system is the way to go. Um, it, it, when you just actually watch how the games are played, and you, know, you guys are dialed into this, when you watch how the games are played, um, when, when it's twelve to one in the in the sixth inning, like you want the umpire to be able to maintain some control of the pace of the game. Yeah, there there are as as good as computerized umpiring may be, as accurate as it may be on one level. We haven't lived on that planet where. Pitchers and hitters think every pitch that is technically a strike or technically a ball is really a strike or a ball. And I, I just I have a problem with those moments which come along with this automatic ball strike system where literally no one in the park thinks that last pitch was a strike except a robot. I, I, I don't think that's the way to go. Agree. There you go. That's music to Todd Father's ears right there. Thank you very much. He loves it. He loves it. He was waiting for that. Well, Jason, it was awesome catching up with you. Enjoy the series out there. We appreciate it. Obviously, I always love reading everything that you've got on The Athletic, so we'll continue to do that. And uh, and a good to see you. These guys have been wanting to get you on for a while. Well, love all three of you guys. A real pleasure <laughs> to join you. Seriously. Right back at you. Thanks, Thank brother. you, Jason. We'll see you soon.